Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashtarothi, and the time is nigh for war. The Uprising pre-event has now hit on Singularity, at least enough of the details for us to get a very good idea of what is coming. We have talked on previous episodes about, some, or, you know, we've talked already about some of these things, but some details have been updated. And this is a good opportunity for us to collect all of the information together and uh, put it out there for people before the event begins. So, what is going on? Uprising is an expansion that is coming to EVE Online, the first expansion in several years, involving the factions of EVE Online going uh, to war. Negotiations and their previous agreements have basically failed, and over the last six months or so, we've been seeing this kind of declining uh, value of politics. You know, politics has been failing in, in increasing ways, and um, it is about to break out into all-out war. So it begins with this event. Now, this event is pretty unique in some interesting ways to previous events. Um, and we'll look at those in turn. But to begin, I believe that it should begin on the 27th, which would be next Tuesday. I think that this is true because, uh, you know, most of these things happen on Tuesday or, or maybe even the Wednesday or Thursday afterwards uh, because Tuesday is their big patch day. But also, they said in the Uprising blog that the new ships will be unveiled through new ARC event uh, this month. And this is the last Tuesday of this month. So it basically has to start on the 27th. Also, Crimson Harvest, in order for Crimson Harvest to go for two weeks and cover, um, and cover Halloween, it must begin on the 18th. So... In order to give up this expansion uh, enough time, or the event enough time to, to play out, it'll probably go from the, either the 27th to the 11th or the 27th to the 18th, depending on how much they want it to bump up against uh, the Crimson Harvest, which is very possible. I actually think that this is very likely a three-week event, just given the nature of it, and we'll talk about that. All right, so first and foremost, the goal overall, or the the... The overall review of the of the event is that each of the four empires are attempting to achieve a goal, and they need us to help them do it. The Amar and the Mimitar are doing one goal, and the Galente and the Kaldari are doing a different kind of goal, right? So what this means is, is that there are both hacking sites and mining sites as part of this event. However, they are both in low sec faction warfare space they're constrained to very small areas and um they are tied to these factions right and and their their progress on in addition to doing the sites and the activities by players within those areas for those groups and we'll talk about what those objectives are in addition to that each faction will gain points for their team per day for every system that they own within the target constellations. And they get a larger chunk of points for holding one of the critical systems. The Galente Caldari have one critical system. The Amara and Mimitar have three critical systems and three constellations. While you do not need to be in faction... Uh, CCP Fozzie has said that you don't need to be in faction warfare to do the exploration or, uh, and... and mining stuff, but you obviously do need to be in Faction Warfare to participate in the system ownership issues. Uh, oh yeah, also, system control is going to influence how many of the sites appear. So, if a, one side has more sites, than, or more systems than the other, then not only are they going to accrue more points passively per day, but also there will be, they will have a more frequent respawn rate for their sites, therefore, people that are trying to do it can actually get it done more effectively, too, and more people can be working on it. So, um, yeah. Uh, the new battle cruisers are going to be right away. So, I'm pretty sure. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get there, uh, which we're almost there. So, the big key and the big difference to this story, this event, versus other events, like, for instance, the previous uh, Stargate event. In the previous Stargate event, the Stargates 
could not fail to build. The only thing we could do, the only thing we were competing for was names on a plaque. In this case, the Kaldari and the Mimitar, or sorry, the, 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 the Kaldari and the Galente are both trying to build a Stargate. However, they have pointed out that the Empire can fail to do their objective. So if not enough points are acquired by the Galente during this event, then their Stargate will not be built. Likewise, the Kaldari Stargate, same thing. Both sides are capable of winning, and both sides are capable of win losing. The rewards for these sites, or for, sorry, for completing the tasks, are loyalty tokens that are tied to each race. So Kaldari, Galente, Mimitar, Mar. You can turn in these loyalty tokens to uh, any NPC station within that empire for just ISK, I think, through buy orders. But members of the of the militia can actually go to the their respective militia corporation and turn them in on their LP store for the new battle for the new faction ships, the battle cruisers and the frigates. There are four new exploration frigates and four new uh, battle cruisers, faction battle cruisers that are all coming out. Yeah, the Navy frigates are exploration frigates that have sacrificed things like their salvage bonus and um, maybe a few things here and there, like drones or whatever. Um, but they've gained pretty significant combat capabilities and um, much better combat probing abilities. So these things are really nasty at, at potentially doing like fast tackle or scouting for a fleet. Um, how long? What my prediction is, is that this event is going to last for two to three weeks. It is very possible that they could allow this to continue to be built or work towards after that point, but I would not bank on it lasting more than the 18th. We'll, we'll, we'll start with this, uh, with the racial breakdown, because that allows us to go into detail. First of all, let's go over a few things. The Amar Mimitar side of the war zone is significantly smaller than the Galente Kaldari side of the war zone. The Kaldari Galente side is, I think, just around double the size of the Amar Mimitar war zone. It's also worth noting that the Amar, while the Kaldari does have some pretty active RPers, I think it's pretty safe to argue that the Amar Mimitar side of this conflict have significantly more invested role players. <laughs> In, in the like the seeking to advance the agendas of their faction, um, not just like seek monetary reward. The Galente Kaldari war zone is huge. The Amar Mimitar war zone is much more constrained. So the Amar Mimitar side of this conflict has three different constellations and three different key systems to find these sites. And the sites themselves are gated. You can't actually get into the Amar Mimitar hacking sites without being in a T1 or a faction frigate. And on top of that, have defenders. So if you're on the wrong side and going in, then there are rats that will attack you. We'll be looking at those rats, and I, I sincerely believe that these rats are basically designed to make those faction exploration ships extremely valuable to use on the Amar Mimitar side of the war zone. The Galente Kaldari side of the war zone, however, have a much more constrained war zone. They only are uh, zone. They have one constellation, the Sirthalud, uh, Sirtha, yeah, Sirthitude constellation. I, I, I'm not even going to pretend like I pronounced it correctly. And while the Amar Mimitar side has been given mostly uh, attention on the Ugidi constellation, which is only one of the three. The Sir, the Surf uh, constellation has been the major target of a lot of this RP buildup. So the Kaldari have pretty well fortified it uh, since then. To give a little bit of perspective and background, on the Glente Kaldari side, the system of Athanun is important because, uh, and this entire constellation, because there has been discovery of not only 
major Triglavian settlements on the storm planets within these systems, but also secret Edencom facilities that have been monitoring these places for an unknown period of time, unknown to any of the empires even, uh, like the main empires, uh, or the main bodies of the empires, I should say, until it started, its cloak started to fail a couple months ago. Um, you can watch my video, What's Up with Othanun, for more about that information. We got some excellent coverage by uh, ASMR News. So both of these teams are trying to build this Stargate. Now, they've already built the Stargate on their side, on the high sex side of these, uh, of these branches. So in the system of Samanuni, the Kaldari have started to build their Stargate uh, and almost near in completion. And in Amy something uh, on the Glente side. This is the Amar Mimitar war zone. This is the Kaldari Galente war zone. So the white systems are like high second stuff. So you can see, you know, Tama leads up to Norv. This is the Citadel, Lone Trek, Verge Vendor. So up here is basically Kaldari space. Down here is Galente space, right? Um, high sec wise. So the system of Athanun, which is pretty far away from most most of the main battlements of of the war zone right we usually see fliat we see tama we see nenamelia you know these kinds of systems this area and then kind of this up here becomes more like incidental because this is more the past path up to the nullsec regions um but Othanun is right here pretty deep comparatively and the these these systems here if you go further into high sec for example here it isn't it's like two more jumps to get to amy which will then link to Othanun. and then mesabir is next door to or two jumps rather from valor which leads all the way there so if we got the stargate to to Athenoon, that would allow us to quickly move from various points in the war zone just by going like a jump or two within um, of high of Glente Highsec. From the Kaldari side of point of view, I don't actually know where uh, Samanuni is, but again, having a contact, having a direct one jump connection into here from the heart of your Highsec is pretty gosh darn good for uh, an empire as far as an advantage. So if this is like our one opportunity to have the gate, that could be a strategic advantage for one or the other of the factions that will will just feel forever, um, which would be pretty wild. So I, I hope that we built the Stargate. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Amar area, we have the systems of Vard, the system of Turner, and the system of Egmar. These three systems and their surrounding constellations are, uh, they all have this thing. This is the Amar Solar Transmuter. I have a longer video that you can check out, uh, Why Do the Amar Solar Transmuters Matter? Uh, where I go into detail as to why these things are super dangerous. But all I'm going to say is, is that, like, there is every reason to believe that this what they are mining here, it, like people are like, oh, are we going to get passive sun mining? Like these aren't just on accidental suns. They're all on blue stars, the same as the Triglavians. These aren't just random mining vessels. This is the Amarian's reconstruction of the Triglavian technology that was used to create Pachvin. And I have some more advanced theories about what this could do or mean, uh, but I'll save those for another time. But suffice it to say, that one of the leading theories about what these things do is extract isogen 5. I guess the short of it is, is that it's kind of Eve Online's MacGuffin and, uh, or Unobtainium. And of all four of the main races, the one race that already knows all of the other information about how to use isogen 5 in an incredibly destructive way is, uh, is the Amar. Having the Amar 
complete their research project as they're trying to do is a very dangerous idea because they're not just mining like hyper titanium titanium they're they're yeah they're mining magic space dust potentially i don't know we'll, we'll have to figure out i will say real talk though if you are talking about this going into a real feature the other thing that these transmuters do is affect the local space-time topology around the star. They transmute the star to cause effects within the solar system. So if anything, I would say that this is leading towards that idea that like NullSec can now customize their systems more. So like maybe if you place a transmuter down, you can make it so that, you know, pirate anomalies don't spawn, but now tritanium does, or, you know, whatever. Um, because these things can alter the nature of the solar system that they are uh, used on in some incredibly drastic ways, including what kind of resources are available within them. So there you have it. Thalassonite, Beznazine, and um, Rakavine spawn in Pochfin when they didn't spawn in those systems originally, uh, and they spawn there natively now. So even if they just allowed um, um, the Nullseckers to be able to spawn Abyssal Ores in their system, that's enough, right? Because Abyssal Ore is both, has both high-sec and low-sec uh, minerals in it. Yeah, I... Right now, all three of these transmuters remain in the com control of the MR. If the Amar remain in control of these three tower, uh, these three systems, and therefore are able to complete their research project unattested, uncontested, uh, I think that that would be probably one of the more dangerous results that could come out of this event. I'll put it that way. They must be stopped. Okay. So, as we said, the Galente side have a much smaller constrained area but on top of that their main points of interest are going to be ore anomalies ore anomalies are able to be seen by any ship on the ship sensor they are not needing to be scanned those are signatures and therefore these are open for anybody to warp to they do not appear to be gated they do not appear to be guarded um and uh, asterisk on I suspect that an ore anomaly will probably have enough ore in it that it'll last for a little while, making it kind of like a fixed point of interest, at least like a couple hours or whatever. So taking, holding, and controlling these sites long enough to mine them and extract the resources is going to be critical. One of the caveats here, though, is that the Caldari and the Galente want two totally different ore. So the Caldari can't mine Galente sites. Galente can't mine Caldari sites. But this also means that Caldari can't gank Galente to get their ore to then turn in, right? Because they can't turn it in as their ore. Effectively, the only thing that they can do with that ore is probably trash it, right? All ore that you want to get credit for, once you've mined this ore, the next complication is that the ore needs to be turned in at a location in Othanoon, which is a two-system dead-end uh, pipe, heavily controlled by the Caldari at the moment, um, with only one way in and out. So you have to potentially, or you have to figure out some way to get that ore in. Now, there's no, like, bubbles or anything like that, but it could be fun. Once you've gotten the ore, you bring it to Othanoon, you bring it to your side's main station, and you turn it in. The, your, your side gets points, and you get a ticket. You get one of these um, one of these loyalty tokens. You can now take that ticket to a, a station to either sell for ISK or to a faction, like a militia faction corporation station, uh, and use it on their LP store to get the new ships as BPCs. Most faction ships are a little bit cheaper than pirates because like when you build some of these pirate and fa pirate uh, and faction ships from a bpc you have to get the special exploration and, uh, and gas doodads that the in industry changes made that is what made these ships very expensive but faction ships never spiked as much as pirate ships 
because there's a secondary vector for them. If you bring the core ship, a chip, and LP, you can transform them into the faction ship, right? If I bring an Incursus and a chip, I can make a comet, circumventing the BPC. So we were able to make those far cheaper than you could produce them by BPCs. From my understanding, I don't think that at least during this initial phase, that is going to be an option. We're going to be able to turn in these tickets for a BPC. So you get the ore, you bring it to Othenir, you turn it in, you get the ticket, you bring it to your, sta to your militia station, you turn it in, you get the BPC. The Amar side is different in several critical ways. So first of all, remember, the Amar side has almost basically three times as much space to cover. Three times the constellations, three key systems to hold for extra points, uh, so on and so forth. They both have their own site as well, but these sites are signatures because they require hacking. These are hacking sites. While, while the Galente Caldari side are, are mining, the Mimitar Amar side are doing hacking ev uh, event. The kicker to these, though, is that these sites are gated and guarded. The gate only allows Tech 1 and Faction Frigates through, and the guards, according to the report, will shoot anyone that is not in the militia, in that militia. Now, again, CCP Fozzy has confirmed that these activities can be done by somebody outside of the war zone, so you don't have to be Mimitar or Amar to be able to do these sites. But I think that if you're going to want to do these sites without being one of those two, you're probably going to need one of these new combat exploration frigates, so that way you can both fight off the rats and hack the site. The rats themselves are not that strong. Let's let's actually take a look at them real quick. Each side has two guards that are frigates. And don't mind the models, we're on singularity. And these stats may not be permanent, you know, whatever. But it would appear the Amar side, this can't be right. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that this is going to change. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe maybe they have missiles. No, because missiles shouldn't show up here, I don't think. Either way. So these are small frigates. So a those exploration frigates, these new combat versions, should honestly be able to fight these guys off, I would say. There are going to be Mimitar and Amar hacking sites. Those sites are going to be guarded by the respective people. So if you're Mimitar, you go to the Mimitar sites, go past the Mimitar guards who let you in, and then hack their cans. That's what it seems to me. And then recover the data and turn it in. Likewise, the Amar. You can hack the other people's sites. You just have to deal with the guards. Which brings us to the critical thing here, where the Galente side, the ore was different. In the Amar side, it appears as if Everything on the inside is this, it, it, or, you know, the, the, everything past the guards is basically the same. You're going to be hacking the same can and getting the same stellar observatory report as your reward. The key there is, is that now you can actually kill somebody else, get the stuff that they've done. You can even use it on your side, regardless of what side they were on. The other major difference here is that while the Galente Caldari one had that uh, turn in in Othanun, which is like going to be one of the more dangerous systems out of this whole shtick, um, the Amar Mimitar turn ins are actually in two different locations in their respective high sec system uh, space. So you can just extract it out to high sec and then turn them in. The Mimitar collection point is in ammo, and the Amar collection point is Mehator. What that means is is that this could actually see emergent strategies. You could actually gate camp people or try to, you know, interdict people trying to extract the sheets out of the war zone or the, the data. The other big difference between these two events or the two sides of this event is the ultimate reward. Having a new Stargate from the heart of your high sec to the pretty deep into your faction warfare space, I don't think I need to like go into too much detail to explain that that's a big deal and that's a thing that happened and that's something to point to however they are being incredibly coy about the results of the Mimitar Amar side of things the only thing that they say is that their stellar research project will be completed we don't actually know what that means we might get more information 
as it goes live, but all of this stellar manipulation stuff has been uh, pretty shady from the beginning. So even if they told you what they wanted it for, I'm not sure if we should outright believe them. You know, the Amar have been studying the captured Porvitium transmuter for a while now. And so at the very least, it might be handy for some of this data to fall into the hands of the Mimitar just so it could get exposed as necessary. But that, that, that may be a bit of propaganda. Um, but as I, as I noted here, Bob help us all uh, based on this because the implications of what they could do with this tech is, is pretty frightening. Will not be released to players level of frightening. It's also worth noting that these Mimitar rats started dropping things uh, recently, the, the hints to the probe. Um, and they're still fighting. So who knows what these guys are going to do, or what these guys are going to be worth during the actual uh, event themselves. But I digress. Um, here are the loyalty tokens in case you're interested in checking those out. They look pretty much the same. Um, interestingly enough, this, these icons look like they come from, um, they're at least inspired by images from echoes because in echoes, there's, there's things that look very much like this that are used to like unlock new missions. These are, so you're looking for, the Amar Mimitar side is gonna be looking for these Republic Stellar Observation Data Hub and the Imperial Stellar Observation Data Hub. Um, however, within them, there is, as I've seen only, there might be one other that was added in earlier, like a base hacking tier, but there are two different hacking cans available uh, one is the data bank and one is the mainframe. So these are going to be two different tiers of hacking sites. So, so probably like yellow and red. What will likely happen or what could happen, what, what probably will happen actually now that I think about it, is in one of the previous events, what they did was they put the easy to hack cans on the outside. So there was like three or four cans on the outside. And then there was, you know, another four or five of the better cans on the inside. So... Even if you couldn't get into the inside, you could either hack the outside, you could stay on the outside and hack the cans out there, but that leaves you exposed. Once you got in, only things that uh, only other things, only a certain number of things could even get in after you. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the lower tier of these are found outside of the hacking signature, uh, outside of this, the acceleration gate, and the one the other ones are inside. But that is just a guess. And then the Amar Mimitar side have the Federal Strategic Mazanite Cluster and the State Strategic Polycrase Cluster. I know, Crimson. I know. That's why I keep bringing it up. And then the MacGuffin that, you're, that both of the Amar Mimitar side is going for is... Uh, oh, never mind. So... This is the comm tower. So yeah, there are three different levels of difficulty of of cans available. The first one was just added in in the beginning, but I still caught it. And then this is the this is what you're going to collect: the stellar research data. And it says right here that the Amar and the Mimitar are interested in it, and it tells you where to go to turn them in. And as I said, these are both within their high sec, not low sec, like uh, the Galente Caldari side. It's worth noting that there is also these new irregular frigates that were added. Irregular frigates are event rats. Uh, the Merlin, the Condor, the Kestrel, the Tristan, the Atron, and the Accursus. There may have already been others put in too. I'm not sure about these. They were nestled in the files in such a point where they might not even be related at all. But I wouldn't be surprised if this is part of like the roaming packs that are flying around within these systems, kind of like these diamond rats that you see uh, flying around here. Let's look at the the exploration frigates are all kind of the same, just like the exploration sh ships are kind of the same, I guess. So the in general, what we see is a loss of the 
um, salvaging bonus. And all but the Imicus lost all of their drones, if they had any. And uh, they, you see a reduction in one of the resources and a raise in the other. I think, like, what, lower CPU, higher power grid, or lower power grid, higher CPU? I'm not 100%. I don't remember. But what they get out of this is a pretty nasty combat bonus for each one of them, a uh, better tank, like more hit points, uh, a little bit faster, a bit more of the other resource. So, like, I'm pretty sure it's maybe it's a higher CPU, lower. Um, no, they don't have skins yet. My cat is coming to sabotage everything. All right, well, this should be fun. But the other big one is this 99% reduction in scan combat or scan probe launchers. What this means is that these ships can pretty easily fit combat probes, which allows them to be pretty good scouts and tackle for a fleet. The reason why this is so critical is because all of the other major combat probing options are all locked behind Omega. However, combat probing is not so what these ships do among other things is they offer a reasonable combat probing platform for alpha clones to be able to function in that role within their fleet in addition to that these are this is also going to be true about the battle cruisers we have a faction warfare change coming and one of the big things about that faction warfare change is that there will be navy restricted sites now so under more, most conditions, um, any well, in all of the faction warfare sites, or if they allow faction in, then they allow pirate faction, right? So even novices, because it allows all T1, will allow pirate ships in. So, you know, brand new bro in his Atron is fighting a worm. And that's a little bit of an extreme. So they're making it so that certain, you know, the sites can also be restricted to being Navy, no pirate. So the idea that there's this new line of Navy frigates and Navy battlecruisers, it's no coincidence that they're also putting in a new battlecruiser tier um, site. These are really kind of designed to slot into those places, right? And, and, and perform in those areas. Likewise, they've said that there's going to be new activities to do within the war zones after Uprising based on like how close to the front lines you are or whatever. And so these exploration ships combat exploration ships may be able to open up new kinds of exploration opportunities. Like for instance, what we see in this event, you know, if we in fact do have a site that has rats in it, but you want a combat hack in, then these are perfect for that, right? Right now there's sites that can be completed by a defenseless frigate and sites that require some of the best shit in the game to do and not much in the middle when it comes to like difficulty, especially towards the lower lower end when it comes to these exploration combat sites. So the idea that these these guys could actually like engage with this stuff and we can mingle combat with hacking more, I think that that could be only good. Uh, SOE is a pirate faction. I would argue yes, but for the purposes of ships, yes. So far, I don't think that they have um, skins at all, but I mean, we're about to get the heraldry system, and that doesn't mean that they're not going to add any. Uh, the Imicus Navy issue does have drones, though. Four light drones, and uh, they have enough for two and a half flights. So I think it's the drone capacity they got increased, I'm pretty sure. Uh, which is, you know, whatever. What, so one of the other madness, though, is that the Magnate, right? This Magnate, if you fully deck them out. So the Magnate already was the best frigate to put in your frigate escape bay for the purposes of cargo because exploration ships already have like one of the largest cargoes uh and uh well of all frigates and uh the magnate has the most low slots of all of the um exploration frigates the thing is is that the magnate was already the the best as far as m3 goes like spaced for hauling or put things in and then they went and gave the magnate an extra low slot this is just better like it it has all the space of a magnate and then one more. So this this bad boy can actually get over 2300 M3 pretty comfortably. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that while right now on Tranquility, you would only be able to fill that with ammo and charges and stuff like that, scripts and such, uh, there is another change on Sissy, which says that now you can also include modules 
and uh, filaments in the in the in the bay. So it's very possible that these are going to become incredibly strong hauling tools to add a couple extra thousand M3 to your battleship as you're moving around that even if your battleship does get ganked as you're moving around, you get to run away. That's for the SMA. We'll see. If it isn't for the... I thought it was for anything that does go into Suff. You're right. It may not cover the escape bay, but I thought it also co covered like... Yeah, it's the ship maintenance array. It's It all uses the same rules, though, about what's allowed to be in the cargo. So I don't know why they would change it for one side and not the other. We could test it. But, I mean, there's only one warning message, and it got edited, not added. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong about that. But it is a change that is coming on some level. The problem with this is that you can't access... In order to access your frigate escape base cargo from your battleship, you do have to eject out of your battleship, which has some complications. I have a video about that. It's... I don't remember its exact name, but it says it's a terrible idea. Okay, so Flea Harvey Oswald says that CSM asked about it, and the answer was that they treated it the same way. There's no reason to believe that they work on two different systems, so a change to one would change to the other, because it's the same rules. I'm sure that once this gets figured out, and those two changes, like, I I would not be surprised if that doesn't get reined in at some point. I'll put it that way. But it sounds like this is the way it's going to go live. Now, as far as the battle cruisers go, each one of these are different, so we'll have to talk about them kind of conceptually. Extra special thanks to uh, the, these two Reddit posts. This guy, his breakdown was incredibly good. And I agree with like 90% of it about the event. And uh, this this guy actually posted it before, gave his feedback. And I think CCB Aurora acted on it. And then so he put up an updated thing. And so these are a good analysis of the different battle cruisers and their kind of roles and stuff. Again, one of the things, though, to keep in mind, these new ships are going to be one of the major contexts that they will be fighting in is in a plex. So when you're inside of a plex, you know exactly where your enemy is going to land. Does that put Galente in an interesting position? Is there some major way to leverage Jones? Uh, I would say that one of the things that does is it makes it so that if you're trying to just, strictly speaking, have a T1 ship that is just the toughest nut to crack and always stays alive, having it be an Imicus Navy issue is going to be the correct answer because you can carry four ECM drones now, which is a bit of a better Hail Mary. Let's begin with the Prophecy. The Prophecy is an odd duck. It's the one that took us the longest to kind of figure out last time. So the... Prophecy actually lost drone capabilities. You actually should stop thinking about the Prophecy Navy issue as a drone boat. It's not. It, it has 50 megabit per second, which is fine, but that's five medium drones. That's just a full flight of medium drones. That is, uh, I mean, it is bonused, but it's half bonused. So you can think of the drones as just being, you know, really good support drones rather than being its main weapon system. One of the big things that defines the Prophecy Navy issue, it gets the 25% roll bonus for its weapon system that you would expect from a battlecruiser, but then it also gets a 50% optimal range bonus from its Amar battlecruiser bonus. So that's double range bonus on a weapon system that's designed for projection. I called it basically a, a, Navy a, a baby Navy APOC. Some people have likened it to the Augur Navy issue. But the point of the matter is, is that this thing is going to be able to hit pretty far or, you know, with a, a pulse, it's going to be able to hit really hard at basically the entirety of normal engagement ranges for plex fighting and such. Oh, yeah. And the resist bonus became a hit point bonus. Some people have kind of grumbled about, but a couple things about that. First of all, because it's a 10 percent bonus to armor hit points. So if you plate your ships, you're actually going to get more out of it, I believe. Uh, the Prophecy actually got a high slot and a turret. So, yeah, it's it's way more committed to that idea of like being a, uh, a laser snipery kind of ship rather than a drone ship. It's got good drones, good powerful drones to swat off smaller things, though. That's true. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a bricky boy. But that makes sense, though, right? Because like the Damnation is the most bricky 
um, command ship too. The Ferox Navy issue um, is interesting. It gains a mid slot. It doesn't get lose. Oh, it, it was losing a range bonus. Apparently, it didn't change. Okay, hold on. This is actually some pretty significant changes from what we saw last time. The Ferox actually didn't have all of its bonuses last time, so now it does. It actually has <clears throat> a bonus for shield booster activation cost and for shield booster power and CPU requirements. So shields are mostly about big bursty reps and shield boosters are often oversized. Uh, it, so it has a reduction in how much it costs to use and how much it costs to fit, which means these Ferox Navy issues are going to be have oversized shield boosters all the time. But from my understanding, this does not cover. Yeah, it doesn't cover ASBs because ASB's big strength is, uh, sorry, ancillary shield boosters use cap boosters to make it so that they don't cost anything because shields often take tons of capacitor. But so this ca activation cost can't apply to that. So this is going to be used mostly with standard shield boosters, relying on this big uh, reduction to cut the cost of the shield booster to reasonable levels. This is likely because the Ferox fighting in a Plex will have to be more brawly and more independent. The Myrmidon, the most controversial of them all, the one everybody thinks is going to be terrible and I can't wait for. It didn't lose any of its drone capabilities, but it did add hybrid turret ability. So it gained hybrid turret bonus for both damage, 50% damage bonus and 25% fall off bonus. It gained, it's a little bit faster. It gained more drones for its bay. It can target further. And it has a bonus high slot, probably for that, you know, extra turret stuff. Why is this cool? Actually, I, I want to I wanna call out this Stasis Web of Fire drone bonus. So because the other bonuses it has is it has its drone hit points and damage bonus. And it has this Stasis Web of Fire drone bonus. And that's what's kind of stood out to people as being really confusing. Uh, because they see that Stasis Web of Fire drones are too weak. And there have been some people that have rightfully pointed out that webs are supposed to be a Mimitar thing. Why is this showing up on the Glente thing? And I think to answer this, you actually have to kind of go back a little bit. Uh, the EOS changed into a ship that works with Sentry drones. However, the EOS prior to this change had a drone, uh, a web drone speed bonus, as in like it can, the drones themselves were faster. I feel like that got, that got lost in that transition. And this is CCP's way of not only restoring that beat, but making it more applicable because stronger drone, you know, 50% stronger webs is probably a lot better than having web drones that can catch up, but not doing anything once they show up. Do I think it's going to be stronger than the EOS? No, I wasn't saying that. What I'm saying is, is that I think that because remember the EOS and the Myrmidon hull are the same hull. So I just think that that's why they gave the Myrmidon Navy issue these Webifier drones was to be a thematic echo to the previous web drone bonus that the EOS had. However, 50% bonus to Stasis Webifier drones is actually pretty good, especially since one of the reasons why web drones are bad is because of stacking penalties. Therefore, because each webbing drone does only a little, when they all hit, they don't do that much more than a little. But when you bump them all up by 50%, they actually start to do pretty decent amounts of webbing, even as in, uh, with medium drones, right? Or even light drones. The other point to web of fire drones is that web drones can web outside of normal web range. They work up to drone control range, whereas webs, generally speaking, last from 9 to 15. If this Myrmidon was planning on using, say, rails, as its primary damage and keeping its distance, it actually could be kind of funny to make it so that your web drones are holding them down far away. Redline ESSs are tactically very similar 
to combat plexes. That's my polite way of putting it, I guess. Which brings me to the final use of this thing, which I think that a lot of people aren't necessarily considering. You can actually either have a fast tackle on the beacon where people land within the site and then assign your drones to them so the drones are on the beacon where where, or where they land and you can be off somewhere <laughs> in, in the site. Or even if you don't have somebody else, you could actually w land in the site, drop your drones, abandon your drones, burn off the butt a beacon, and then just wait. And the moment you know that, you know, right click on your on your capacitor and get ready to reconnect to lost drones. And the moment you see them start to land or you know that they're activating, you just reconnect the lost drones and now your drones are there. You lock them and web them. I know that there's a lot of people that are kind of sketchy on this thing, but I suspect it could be pretty fun. The other thing to remember is you don't have to use these web drones. They also have, it also has standard damage bonus. You can just go combat drone and hybrid turrets and slam them up if you want to. And then if you need to, you can swap them. If, if keeping range from them, if you think you can keep them at bay with it and you can peg them from distance, then you, then you could use the weapon fire drones if you want to. I don't know. I think that that's pretty slick. The one problem with assisting it to a, a tackle frig, though, is that damage dealing drones will assist. In other words, as soon as your opponent, or as soon as your uh, the, th the person that you have them assisted to attacks or activates a hostile module, that drone will then also attack. That, last I checked, does not work with e war drones. The idea of like your fast tackle also locking and getting your drones on them, you're still going to have to lock the target yourself and stick your drones on them. I am not sure exactly how guarding works whether or not like they, you could set it to guard so that way they go after them but the point of the matter is to make sure your drones are there at the beacon so that way they're ready to grab and finally the cyclone navy uh, fleet issue which is kind of the most straightforward 25 percent bonus to signature radius explosion radius to explosion velocity what does that do well i mean they're both applications oh it matches the mimitar bonuses more fair enough did i does this not Oh, is this guy just reporting the changes from the previous one? I thought the Cyclone fleet issue... Yeah, the Cyclone fleet issue gains a high slot and gains a turret slot. In a very, very real way, the Cyclone fleet issue is a Cyclone, but more. They just, they just strapped an extra missile launcher to a Cyclone, gave it the faction, you know, tank and application treatment, and called it good. I mean, it's it's going to be pretty strong, actually, I think. So explosion velocity versus explosion radius. Uh, an explosion radius would make it so it's better at hitting smaller things, where explosion velocity would make it better at hitting fa uh, faster things. A uh, frigate was stopped, for example. This bonus wouldn't do anything to it. The frigate would have to be moving faster than the explosion velocity for it to be making too much of a difference. But... It still has like the, uh, it has an increased rate of fire bonus and it lost its shield booster bonus. I really feel like this is one, like the fleet one, the fleet bait, right? Because it, it lets you shoot far with missiles on a battle cruiser platform and hit things regardless of how fast they're going. Am I crazy in, in thinking that they, that this is supposed to be a cheap semi counter to the Munin? Does that, doesn't it feel a little bit like it might? They might be in their heart of hearts hoping that this is going to, because this thing can shoot fast. It can hit things that are moving fast. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know enough about that shit. I'm sure that there's somebody that is going to tell me that I'm stupid and I probably am. But like that's every, every time I look at this thing, I feel like it's designed to kill those, you know, Serb, Munin, you know, even harbinger fleets or whatever. Yeah, the SIG radius got redu reduced too. If these aren't designed to fight the Munins, they're at least designed to be a cheap equivalent. Maybe this could even allow an alpha to slot in with the Munin fleet. I don't know. I don't, like I said, I don't know enough about big nullsec null battles to know how this shit plays out. I'm just saying, like, this screams that kind of tactic to me. So yeah, uh, four new battle cruisers. Four new exploration frigates, one event, two sides, 
two different events, I guess, with two sides each. Hacking and data, it will last for two to three weeks. And if the teams succeed, they get a Stargate or they get their research project completed, whatever the heck that means. Uh, and if they don't get completed, then they don't get them. Uh, the Stargates in particular will be pretty important tactically for the war zone as we move into faction warfare and uprising. And the stellar research could be literally anything. I think that it's really important for people to realize, as I said on Twitter, this is the moments that we will tell stories about. One day, I'll be sitting in front of this camera telling people what happened over the course of the next two weeks and what the results of it. It will be etched into the story. You could argue that the Stargates, like, yeah, our name is on the monument, but you kind of like, that's kind of like the, I know it in my, in my secret space kind of thing. This is that Stargate got built or that Stargate failed to get built because of people's actions. I think that I would like to suggest that that makes this the time to kind of set aside our cynicism a little bit. You know, I've been hearing a lot of people complaining, saying like, this is like Eden Calm, or why should we trust that it's different because of this thing or that thing? Because they said it was different and because they're trying something new and because this is the thing that leads us into the big expansion. The thing that gets me is the number of people who played during invasions, but still come to me. And while we're chatting, they'll be like, oh yeah, I never got it to do invasions. I really should have done that because in the moment, invasions was seen as kind of this niche thing that you know the big people didn't care about that much now people realize what they missed and are sad that those things are no longer available this is a moment that people in the future will have wanted to be able to see and we get to be part of it it may not be perfect it may not be everything we want it's definitely a step in the right direction and I think that it's worth at least giving it a chance that we may actually finally be on the precipice of actually getting somewhere, <laughs> having kind of spun around in circles since 2019 slash after invasion. You don't have to be part of a faction in order to get involved. There will be new ships available probably pretty quickly, starting probably on Tuesday. And uh, let's see if some Stargates get up. There is a point to note, though, um, which is that if the Caldari don't, if the Galente fail, actually, let me address this directly. First of all, I'm going to say that Corvus Onzo is a fantastic Eve streamer. You should check him out. If you want to see every bullshit stereotype notion about low sec and it's PVP or whatever shattered, watch his stuff. When everybody's saying that faction warfare space is dead, he's out there getting fights. While everybody else is saying that solo is impossible, that he's out there doing it. It's not like he's special. I mean, like the faction warfare space is just that way. He's just the one out there showing it. So props to him. That said, he is rather upset at the moment. Uh, and he, as, as the voice of the Caldari state, a month ago or so, when they announced the targets of Othanun and uh, I, I think the Ugidi constellation for the Amar, the Kaldari put in a lot of effort to not just like they already owned it, I think I'm pretty sure, but they secured as much of that constellation as they could and they fortified it pretty heavily. It's also worth noting that Othanun has no stations in it, no NPC stations. So the only way to do it is NPC is player structures, which also makes me wonder how defended are these, um, are these turn in points going to be, <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a shit show. Anywho, um, his complaint was that the Kaldari have won phase one of the pre-expansion event. And we know it, it's pre, it phase one of the pre-expansion event because in the files, this is labeled part two. So like the, the what we've seen earlier with Othanun and stuff and the different data files coming out, that was clearly phase one. So they feel like they didn't get any reward out of that. And it feels to them like the Edencom who got screwed out of a reward. On the most glib, I can and did say, that no one told you that you would be rewarded for this particular action, right? The stuff that's coming, we're told if we do it, we get these, these BPCs. But all that we had before, like an NPC told you to do something and you did it. They didn't promise you anything. 
They just told you to do it and you did it. On top of that, there is reason to believe that there are certain parts of the story that did happen that were impacted by the fact that the Kaldari owned the system. For example, there is speculation, the Edencom videos that came out, they have Kaldari forces breaching the Edencom for, uh, Tenshu. If the Galente had taken the system, it is very possible that they could have quickly or like easily made it so that it was a Galente force that was doing it. So it had some subtle ramifications. But let's be real. Owning the entire constellation from the beginning of the match is an incredible advantage. Not only is you're getting the most sites, you're getting all of the passive stuff. And from my understanding, if we don't take a shard at some point during that period of time, which sieges often, like a siege is very successful if it concludes within like a week. So they could, we could have an a siege that goes the entire length of the time and we only flip it like maybe in the last day and that's if it goes well. All they have to do is hold their territory and they win. There is a very real chance that the Galente could get shut out. There is very little chance that the Kaldari will get shut out. And that's largely because of the fact that when this RP stuff started to come out, the Kaldari bought into it and the Galente fucked off and did other things. I, yeah, I agree. I don't think that there's a bait and switch there. I can understand why it feels kind of icky. I, I wouldn't mind if they did post something about it or acknowledge it in some way. But I personally believe that control of the entire constellations ahead of time was, uh, was a pretty big bonus. But why that specific system? Uh, well, I, I have a video about this, but no, um, there was all, it's a Triglavian minor victory. It is a Triglavian minor victory that the pro Triglavian, uh, pro Kaldari group was trying to make like political union that happening there. There's a lot of Triglavian occupations within that area. Tactically, like I said, it's an entry point to the war zone that, especially for the Kaldari, but even for the Galente, is a new way to go from pretty deep in your own high sec into effectively the middle of the war zone. That allows for a ton more coverage. And it was pretty contested. The reason why it's not contested now is because for the last two months they've been, or for the last month they've been killing everybody Galente that comes inside when they can or as much as they can and, and, and stabilizing it as much as they can because they got told by their, by their general lady to uh, do that. Two more caveats. One important, one possibly important, one probably not important for those of you who managed to stick to, with it to the end of this presentation. Something to keep in mind. In Hoboleaks, among all of the other stuff, is a new string, new set of strings that is very sus. This message says you're, or sorry, this message up here, spoiling myself, you've been denied docking access because you are the enemy of the controlling faction. You are not, you are allowed to dock in your capsule. So this is interesting because, so the way the faction warfare works is that if you join faction warfare, you voluntarily get locked out of any structures or any uh, NPC stations in the war zone that is owned by your enemy. So if I have all my supplies in Devon and somebody flips it, I can't dock there anymore to get my stuff. I'd have to do like out of corp logistics or something like that. This changes that slightly by saying that you are allowed to dock in your capsule, which is kind of interesting and cool. This is more interesting to me. Your undocking request has been denied because you are an enemy of the controlling faction. You are allowed to undock in your capsule. On the, on the one level, we could say, okay, well, all this is doing is making it so that station lockout isn't like full station lockout. You can always dock in your pod. But I think that this has um, a different ramification. The phrasing of these does not specify NPC station. And given these restrictions, why, why would you need them to be able to dock and undock in their capsule? more importantly, dock in their caps, unless this is designed to affect all stations and structures within owning systems. Right now, they, they, this has always been a problem with, with citadels and, and, and beyond. 
and they tried to fix it by removing tether for faction warfare groups within that area but oh and that's what ccp aurora said in a live stream so this is pretty big and because that's in hobo leaks now there is nothing stopping them from having this change go live on Tuesday. So right as all these faction warfare groups are mobilizing to try to control these constellations, this change might actually go into effect. So heads up on that, I suppose. The second thing to note, Farina Ravelli was kind of known before, but not really that well known. Actually, I don't think she was. No, she was unknown before this. Likewise, our, the, the lady that we've gotten a little bit more familiar with, uh, Haik Haika Toriago, she uh, she's pretty new. I don't think she she had much to do before this ha uh, this event. But on the Mimitar side, Kenneth Filmer is definitely has some history. He's a former Republic Admiral. He's been the Val Valkyr General. Like he he's been kicking around. He is a war hero. He's up there with like Krilla Frit. So he is now basically the general of the Mimitar militia fleets. Good for him. Good promotion. What bothers me is this guy, Serdan Zerkosh, because this guy isn't just Captain Marshall. This guy is the Amar delegate on the Concord Inner Council. This guy is, I like to call him the power player that you don't know about. He's been around since probably a, somewhere around the Drifter time period. I, I've actually been wanting to look into exactly when he appears, but he is, uh, he, he, he makes some moves in the middle of the uh, Sine Wave Omega Chronicle, but Zerdan Sirkosh, he, uh, so he put Cassia Valkanir, who's the head of Edencom, into her position. He, like I said, he's the Amar delegate to the Inner Council, so he's got inside information and stuff from, from Concord and such. He, uh, in some of the news order, or, or, they talked about how, like, the Concord Inner Council delegate to the Amar has been briefed by Edencom Intelligence. Well, that was him. Like, he just, he is, ever since his introduction, which was sometime around Rubicon or, before, or after, um... He has been like the face of the Amar in a lot of public ways. And so the thing that's sus about this is we have, you know, general of the militia, general of the militia, general of the militia, inner council member to the Amar, or Amar, inner, Amar delegate to the inner council of, the Con of Concord masquerading as a general. Like, ah, yeah, he's sus. That's all I'm saying. All right, and that's it for this. So if you want to come help us out uh, in Aderon, I'd be happy to have you. In fact, anybody who wants to come and help make this Galente Stargate. Like I said, the Caldari Stargate is pretty darn foregone conclusion. But the Galente Stargate could easily be locked out if given the wrong set of conditions, right? If we can't turn in the ore, if we can't mine the ore, if... You know, whatever, right? So if you want to come help out the Glente, Aderon Robotics is opening our doors, or you can come and be just part of the FDU if you want. But we'll be trying to uh, do our part to make that work. And, you know, if you join us, then you can say that that Stargate exists partially because you did it. We do not just need miners. I mean, obviously, we are, these are in low sec. So we need miners, we need guards, we need scouts, we need haulers. It's a whole thing. And you don't actually need to join the Faction Warfare. You don't need to join Aderon Robotics to be part of it. Um, if you are interested in checking it out, you can join our Discord. Uh, and bug me between now and then, and I'll probably just make like a special role I can give people to coordinate with during the time. So I, I want to go take this opportunity to express my thanks to all of you uh, who watch and check out my stuff and especially the people that support me even more directly in particular I do have my uh, co-designer patrons Black Rose Noble, Dejat Lamont, Midnight Space Monkey, Not Just Fun, Serenalin With No Eyes, Siliana Velesh, Talking In Stations, Nephilim and Grendel, as well as my Immortal Tier patron Ebolite. You guys are awesome. 
I'm going to figure out a way to put everybody's name on a thing and then also include subs at some point soon. But uh, in the meantime, you know, thank you guys. If if make sure to give them a thanks if you want. You know, if it wasn't for your guys' support, I wouldn't be able to do this. Right. Uh, this really is the way I I managed to keep myself with a you know a roof over my head and stuff. And I I feel incredibly blessed to be able to do that. So uh, thank you guys. If you're willing, if you want to join that illustrious group that make this happen, you can by supporting my Patreon for at least a dollar a month. 